Um, in some of the Pew Bibles, it is found on page 825. Page 825. We'll be reading the first seven verses of Nahum, chapter 3. Found on page, in some of the Pew Bibles, page 825. If it's not, uh, not that hard to find, if you find Malachi, last book of the Old Testament, you keep going backwards, you'll hit Nahum. Um, one of the reasons behind this is just a uh, thought I had a while back to get us familiar with some of these Old Testament, more obscure books. Um, and so I think from time to time I'll just be touching on books like Habakkuk and Nahum and, and Obadiah and, you know, some of these books we may not even know uh, that uh, are in the Bible but, uh, or, and certainly not what they mean. And so we want to look at these things from time to time. This afternoon we're looking at the prophecy of the prophet Nahum chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, and uh, we'll be focusing on verses 5 to 7. Uh, the, the name, or the, the, uh, Nahum, or Nahum in the, uh, in the original Hebrew, means uh, something equivalent to comforter or consoler, and so he came with a message of consolation, of comfort to God's people, the nation of Judah, and um, specifically to Judah, who had been tormented, um, besieged and plundered by the nation of Assyria. And... Um, uh, Nahum brings a prophecy against the nation of Assyria and in particular against their great city um, which they took so much pride in, the city of Nineveh. And he promises God's vengeance to come upon that city, Nineveh. Um, so we want to read uh, Nahum chapter 3, starting at verse 1 to verse 7 with particular focus on verses 5 to 7. The prophet speaks these words, Woe to the bloody city, that is Nineveh. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots, horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. Because of the multitude of harlotries, of the, decept, of, of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries, who sells nations through her harlotries and families, through her sorceries. And in our text, God says, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? Our song of preparation is number 110, My Soul in Silence Waits for God. Number 110, we rise to sing stanzas 1, 2, 3, and 5. Mm -hmm. 
Once again, congregation, if you're able to and you can find it back again, uh, please keep your Bibles open to Nahum chapter 3 as we look at verses 5 through 7. Congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, one of the modern uses of social media is called public shaming. And public shaming, shaming happens when someone does something that, say, a chunk of society disapproves of. And then they post his or her picture on Twitter or Facebook and different things, and they make nasty comments about this person, basically to humiliate them as much as possible and kind of take them to task publicly for something that, uh, you know, a section of the public think was uh, an abomination. You may remember uh, a couple of years ago, dentist w uh, Walter Palmer was his name, who shot and killed Cecil the lion. You might remember that. And boy, the public backlash. You know, kill a, kill a baby in the womb, good for you. Kill a lion, a seal, an ape, you are inhumane, and they will take you to task for that. More recently, there was that big riot in Charlottetown in the U.S. between the white supremacists and those who opposed them, and pictures of some of the attendees, especially the white supremacists um, uh, who attended the rally, they were posted online, again, to engage in a form of public shaming of them. Uh, but it's not like shaming emerged with the invention of computers and cell phones. Newspapers have been doing it for years, for centuries. And before that, there, were, there was something called public whippings, and people were put into stocks and left to hang there so that people would come by and, and, look, uh, and, and uh, make uh, comments about them or throw things at them, sometimes spit on them. In fact, I was reading about this. In the, there's something called the Torture Museum in Amsterdam, and there is something there called a shame flute uh, on display that was actually hung around the neck of a bad musician. And there's also a giant rosary, which is kind of a, a, a chain made of beads, more in the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, it was to be worn in olden times by someone who was late for church. And we have to talk as elders about that if we want to reinstate that. Um, in 1944, French women had their heads shaved and marched through, uh, through Paris barefoot for collaborating with the Nazis. And so public shaming has been going on for many, many years. In fact, we even find it in biblical times. In the Bible, we read of a widow taking off uh, the sandal of her brother-in-law and spitting in his face if he would not perform his duty to her as a brother-in-law. And so shaming is a well-known and effective tool. Well, in our passage, we hear of the Lord's plan to do some shaming of His own to the nation of Assyria, with particular focus on their main city, Nineveh. He was going to destroy them, but in such a way as to bring absolute and utter disgrace upon them. All the nations surrounding them would see how powerless and vulnerable they were before the might and vengeance of Israel's God. But ultimately, these words of warning were not really meant to warn Nineveh, but they were meant as a word of comfort to the nation of Judah. In fact, the, the very name, as we said, Nahum or Nahum in the Hebrew means consoler or comforter. And Judah is addressed directly in chapter 1, verse 15. And so we know that this was a message to Judah. What this all means and what it means for us will be our focus this afternoon as we look at Nahum, Chapter 3, verses 5 to 7, under this theme, Judah's God promises public disgrace to Nineveh. Judah's God promises public disgrace to Nineveh. We'll see that it was a fitting punishment, and in the second place, it was a final punishment. But as Judah's God promises public disgrace to Nineveh, we see in the first place that it was a fitting punishment. We all know the saying, let the punishment fit the crime. Well, this is exactly what was about to happen. Nineveh was about to be on the receiving end of some very serious consequences for their actions. And it was most fitting because the Assyrians were not only extremely wicked and violent, but they took pride in what they did. In fact, they built monuments to boast of and to commemorate their savage, heinous, violent victories. Archaeologists and, and scholars are usually startled by the records found of the history of the Assyrians, which reveal a very deep-seated cruelty and an obsessive desire to conquer as many nations as possible. 
Already in 1100 BC, the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser described how he conquered 83 kings and he littered the mountains with their corpses. Two centuries later, another Assyrian king, Azur Nasser Pal II, boasted of flaying, which is skinning alive, captive kings and wallpapering pillars with their skins, walling up captives alive, impaling captives on stakes, putting out eyes, cutting off feet, noses, ears, and excuse me, of cutting off their feet, of their, their victims, noses, ears, and hands, burning children alive. The atrocities and the brutalities of the Assyrians became legendary in the Near East, in the ancient Near East. The Assyrians, by the way, were descendants of Asher, who was the son of Shem and grandson of Noah. And the city of Nineveh, Nineveh was actually built by the mighty hunter Nimrod, who was a, a descendant of Ham. And you can read about that in Genesis 10, verse 11. The first capital city of the Assyrians was in Asher, but at some point it was moved to Nineveh. And according to one source, the goddess Ishtar was worshipped in Nineveh, and she was represented by the, in the form of a fish. And, and Nineveh, as we learn in Jonah 4 verse 11, was populated by at least 120,000 people, and so not a small city. But the main feature of Nineveh was its splendor. It was a rich and flourishing nation and city. One of their kings, Sennacherib, we read about him in, in 2 Kings, he built himself a palace that was 9,880 square feet with sculptured walls depicting his victories. Again, the, again, the pride of these people. And he had a 30-mile channel, uh, channel constructed to bring water into the city. And so they were not hard up for finances. He built botanical gardens and 200 parks in Nineveh. No wonder Nineveh is called in the book of Jonah the great city several times. It was a city and people that took great pride in their accomplishments. But verses 1 to 4 of chapter 3 gives us also a picture of, this, of the corruption and the violence that existed in that city. Uh, in uh, verses 1 to 4 we read, Woe to the bloody city! It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots, horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses because of the multitude of harlotries, of the, of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries, who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. And so Nineveh was saturated with robberies and lies and tricksters and fraudsters and deceptions. And there was no end to people being victimized. The sounds of the city are described as the crack of whips, of chariot wheels and soldiers. Their soldiers rode on horses carrying swords and spears and they left corpses in their wake, dead bodies, so many that they themselves tripped over these corpses. And it was a city of sorcery, that is magic the occult, the dark arts. They practiced all kinds of divination, and they performed whatever rituals demanded by the sorcerers. By calling them harlots, engaged in harlotry in verse 4 is meant to describe how they gave themselves to pagan gods in order to, to gain what they wanted. As a prostitute sells her body for money, so they sold their souls to the evil pagan gods. However, in 612 B.C., they were soundly defeated and conquered by the Medes and the Chaldeans. And by 609 B.C., the Assyrian Empire was gone, as if they had never existed. Why? Because God had brought His warning that we read of in Nahum to pass against them. The Lord says to them in this passage, Behold, I am against you. Now, think about that. Is there anything worse that someone can hear in this life? Understanding who God is as we understand Him from the Holy Scriptures. Now, most of us don't like to have any enemies, let alone God as your enemy. Imagine someone who hates you has the power to hurt you financially, emotionally, physically. Who wants that? 
Well, imagine you have the Almighty God against you. It just doesn't get any worse than that. He is the Lord of hosts, he calls himself. That is the commander and the owner of the heavenly armies, the ruler of every star, sun, moon, and planet in the universe. And so no one can bring the pain like God. And now he says to Assyria, you have just made yourself an enemy, and you are about to learn what a terrible enemy I am. Why have they become God's enemy? Because of what they had done to the nation of Judah. In chapter 2, verse 2, if you have your Bibles open, the prophet speaks of the Assyrians emptying out, emptying out the excellence of Jacob and ruining their vine branches. Now, when this happened, exactly we're not sure, but the sense is that they left nothing of any value. They totally plundered the place. They left, left nothing to rebuild with, nothing to survive on, which was typical Assyrian behavior. When they attacked the city, they mowed you down, and they left you absolutely defenseless. And so the Lord, through his prophet, relates the kind of destruction he was about to bring upon the Assyrians and how fitting this punishment would be. The proud nation would be brought to shame. And their problem is that they had riled up the God of Israel, the true and living God, against them, and they would be brought to utter destruction. In chapter 2, verse 13, he says, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. And so the things that they took pride in, their chariots and their army and their conquests and their boasting, all of these things God would wipe away, would take away from them. Pride, indeed, as the writer of Proverbs tells us, pride goes before the fall. And one of the things that we can learn from this today is that might does not always make right. God sees the oppressor, and he hears the cries of the one oppressed. And people who violate his laws by violence, greed, and hatred will be called to account it may seem that someone gets away with unfair treatment of another, but this passage reminds us that God sees, and he will bring vengeance against those who dishonor his image, which is imprinted upon every human being. And what does that tell us about how we are to live our lives as Christians then? Well, simply this, that we are to treat everyone fairly. We are to give to others what we owe to them. James, in fact, gives a scathing rebuke to the rich in his letter in James 5, verses 1 to 4, and this applies to every one of us, of course. James 5, verses 1 to 4, he, he writes, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. We're reminded here that the cries of those who are taken advantage of reach the ears of God. We may think we have won, but victory over the innocent is really a sign that we have lost and so one of the simple, very Christian things to do is pay your bills and deal fairly with people. Don't take advantage of anyone. Boys and girls, don't bully anyone, especially in school and even in the home. Don't even talk about other people behind their backs or laugh at them. In the home, treat everyone with love and respect. Why? Because we see it here again in this passage. God sees and He knows all that we do and he will give to each person as they deserve. And so pray about these kinds of things, confess your sins, seek the Lord's Holy Spirit that we may change more and more. Another thing we can learn from this is to have patience in trial. As we said, the whole prophecy of Nahum is in fact a consoling word to Judah. In chapter 1, verses 12 to 13, we read this, Thus says the Lord, though they are safe and likewise many, speaking of the Assyrians, yet in this manner they will be cut down when he passes through. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. 
for now I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. God says this to his people Judah. Verse 15, Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feasts, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. And so as we go through life's trials, as we find ourselves on the receiving end of unfair treatment, the message here is wait on the Lord. Know that He sees. Know that He cares. And He will bring justice and He will bring relief in His time. Again, listen to what the Apostle James writes in his letter, uh, verses uh, 7 to 8 of chapter 5. James 5, verses 7 to 8. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain? You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. It may be that the Lord will give us justice in this life, but if not, of this we can be sure. Christ will return again, and He will bring trouble upon those who have troubled us. Let them laugh. Let them think they have won. Their day will come. Fitting punishment shall be the reward of the enemies of God and of His people. But as Judah's God promises public disgrace to Nineveh, we see in the second place that it was a final punishment. And by this we mean, boys and girls, not that this was the last time that God would punish them, but that this punishment was final in its severity. There would be no coming back from this. It would be over for Assyria. The fame of their great city, Nineveh, was about to come to an end. Let's listen to what the Lord promises to do to them. Verses 5 to 7. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile, and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? In very symbolic yet very graphic language, as often found in the Bible, the Lord describes what He was about to do to Nineveh. He says He was going to lift their skirts over their face and show their nakedness to their neighbors. And sometimes um, little, our little girls, little toddler girls, will sometimes lift up their dress in public, much to the horror of us as parents. Why is that? Because there are certain parts of our body that are meant to be kept private. We all wear clothes, not merely for warmth or fashion, but to cover our bodies. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 speaks of, of us treating our unpresentable parts with greater modesty. Since the fall, our nakedness has become a matter of shame. Adam and Eve hurriedly tried to cover themselves with fig leaves when sin took away their innocence and caused them to feel shame at their unclothed bodies. The generations of Noah's son, Ham, was cursed because he looked at his father's nakedness. In the time of King David, we read of his messengers being disgraced when the Ammonites cut off their garments to expose their buttocks. We even have nightmares. Maybe you ha you've had this. I know I have. We have nightmares about being pu in public without clothes on or forgetting your pants or, or something. And you, those kinds of dreams, you wake up in a cold sweat. Probably one of the most degrading terrifying things you can do to a person, as, as boys will often do in a high school locker room, will be to pull their pants down or they pull their towels off when they've just had a shower. Tough, tough guys can be brought to tears in such a situation. Why? Because we, we feel very conscious about our bodies and we want our private areas to be covered up. And so when the Lord promises to lift the skirts of the Ninevites over their faces, it was a way of him saying that he was going to shame them publicly. It would be a, a national depensing. He would expose the harlot for the harlot that she was. All their pride would be taken away, finally and fully. They would be held up before the nations to ridicule. In fact, what the Assyrians had done to many people, literally stripping them of their clothes and their dignity and causing them to walk around naked, they actually did this to people, but that would be done to them figuratively. And so God would shame them publicly. 
But nakedness in the Bible also carries a sense of vulnerability or weakness. Uh, think of uh, Joseph when he spoke of his brothers and he accused them of coming to Egypt to spy out the nakedness of the land. In other words, he was accusing them of coming into Egypt to see where there was weakness so that they could come back and attack the nation. And so when God promises to show the nations the nakedness of Assyria, he was saying that he would publicly display before all people how weak and vulnerable they were. They made themselves out to be something, but they were really nothing. And the God of Israel would bully the big bullies. He would shame them in such a way that they would never recover. Being stripped naked was also a sign of God's judgment. In fact, he says the same thing to Judah in Jeremiah 13, verses 25 to 26. In Jeremiah 13, verses 25 to 26, he says to Judah, This is your lot, the portion of your measures from me, says the Lord. Because you have forgotten me and trusted in falsehood, therefore I will uncover your skirts over your face that your shame may appear. And so for all the wrong that Assyria had done, for all the disgrace that they had placed upon so many people, they would now stand under the just judgment of God. The Lord goes on to say as well in verse 6 that he would cast abominable filth upon them and he would make them vile and make them a spectacle. We might think of the incident in 2 Samuel 16 where David flees from his son Absalom and a man named Shimei flings dust and stones at the king as he's riding on his donkey going by, as he's going up the mountain. And it's a way of disgracing somebody. Sometimes um, people throw eggs at politicians or sometimes fruit, rotten fruit, uh, or, in uh, or they, they throw it at criminals. Um, in prison, I hear, they will throw urine on you, sometimes feces, things like that. Uh, it's a way of uh, declaring you to be disgusting, and this is what I really think of you. Now, it doesn't say here exactly what abominable filth would be cast on Assyria, but we can only imagine the worst, S something like dung. In fact, in Malachi 2, verse 3, the Lord talks about spreading refuse on the faces of His people for their unclean worship. And the picture we, that we want to get is that of disgrace. God would make them gross and disgusting. The fall of Assyria would be so great that they would be as someone who had dung thrown on them so that no one wants to be close to them, not even to look at them. They would be detestable and abhorrent. People would flee from them and say, Nineveh is laid waste, verse 7. All nations would gasp in horror that such a thing could possibly come to pass, that the great city, Nineveh, and its mighty people could be finished in such a way, defeated and deflated, never to rise again. And yet not one person would bemoan them or seek to comfort them. As horrified and filled with unbelief as the nations would be, not one tear would be shed for Assyria. No one would feel any sympathy for them, which tells us something about how wicked these people actually were, how incessantly brutal they were, how oppressive they were, and now they would languish alone in their final state of destruction. But you know, this image takes our thoughts to someone else in history who suffered alone in disgrace. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed Son of God. And like the Assyrians, he too would be stripped of all his dignity. He would be li literally stripped of all his clothes so that he would hang naked on the cross. And the abominable filth of our sin would be hurled upon him. And he would be made a spectacle so that those who passed by shook their heads, say the Gospels, and beat their breasts at him. He became a reproach of men and despised by the people, says Psalm 22, verse 6. Isaiah 53, verse 3, prophesied that people would hide their faces from him. He would look for comforters and find none. But unlike the Assyrians, Jesus would not stand under the shame of God's judgment for his own sins but for ours. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. 
Isaiah 53 tells us that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And so, congregation, this passage calls us not to shake our heads at the wicked Ninevites or feel satisfied in some way that, well, good, they finally got what they deserved. This passage calls us to thank God for His grace to us in Christ, His Son. It calls us to remember that Nineveh was a picture of us all, wicked, unjust, defiled by all kinds of sin. In fact, listen to the way the Apostle Paul describes us in Romans 1, verses 29 to 32. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And so without Jesus, let's understand that we would all hear God's pronouncement of our guilt, behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. And we would have nothing to look forward to but the final punishment, eternal shame and torment in hell. But God is merciful and gracious, and he sent his son into the world to suffer his wrath for us. And now we can either stay in Nineveh and await the coming destruction, or we can enter into the kingdom of God's beloved Son, the Savior He has provided, and be safe from the coming judgment. Beloved of God, let us believe in Jesus. In Revelation 3, Jesus says to us, in verse 18, Revelation 3, verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eyesol, that you may see. Let us make sure that we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Let us believe God's promise that whoever puts their trust in Him shall never be ashamed. Amen. Let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you for the wake-up call, the reminder that we all are like Nineveh, that wicked city, full of pride and boasting and wickedness, left to ourselves, wanting nothing to do with you. But in your mercy and grace, you have not destroyed us. You have not brought the full brunt of your wrath against us but you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb, who had no sin, to be sin for us and to take upon himself the tremendous force of your anger and judgment. We pray that today and every day we would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be clothed in his righteousness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 85 is our song of application. God is our refuge and our strength. It's based on Psalm 46. Number 85, we rise to sing the three stanzas. <laughs>